Well, thanks for coming. Oh, we're going to talk about power and the practicality of immutability. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is immutability. I'll talk about uh, when it comes to programming in languages like Java, where we have predominantly focused on a mutating state of objects all the years. Uh, how could we suddenly think about even making things immutable? Well, books like Effective Java has uh, reminded us in the past that we should uh, favor immutability. Uh, but of course, that was a great recommendation, but you know, was it really even practical? And, and that's exactly what I want to focus on today, uh, maybe three different things. One is talking about what is immutability, uh, get a little deeper about uh, what it really means to make things immutable, and then uh, talk about what are some of the reasons to really do it. So let's get started. Well, uh, best time to ask questions or make comments is when you have it, so please don't hesitate to ask questions or make comments along the way if you draw my attention and sp speak. I'll be delighted to hear what you have to say. So let's talk about uh, what does uh, really immutability mean? Well, immutability, of course, is the opposite of mutability, where mutability is where we modify the state of a certain object. Whether it's a primitive or a full-blown object, we modify its content. And that's basically what mutability really is. Now, uh, it turns out that mutability is something that we all do quite often, but then why should we really be concerned about doing mutability? Uh, if you really think about it, uh, we do certain things that are very predictably irrational. Let, let's think about this for a minute. Uh, let's step back to Java 1.0. I know that's a long time ago. Let's switch back in time. Uh, what was the uh, you know, thread class constructor taking as a parameter? It took up as a parameter runnable. Now, remember what runnable interface is. It is public, well, of course, because it's an interface, and it's a void, and then run, and this. Now think about this for a minute. What is that method saying? It says, I will not take anything as an input, and I will not give you anything as an output. How rude. If you really think about it, right? So here is a function that takes nothing and gives nothing. That's like some employees at work, right? Nothing goes and nothing comes out of them. But if you really think about it, this is pretty darn scary. Because if you really think about it, how do you really use runnable? The only way you can use runnable is to put a mutating state out there and then call a function and say, you go, I have put a variable there, you can take that variable and use it, and then you can put back a state in it and I'll come back and get it. So this is why I call it predictably irrational because this forces mutation on our code uh, by the definition of the fact that you cannot send anything to it and get anything back from it which is pretty scary because what have we learned from since the time of Java 1.0? Uh, and that is that mutability is OK. Sharing is a really good thing. Remember what mom told us, we should really share. But shared mutability is devil's work. And unfortunately, the minute we bring in shared mutability, it becomes really, really hard for us to work with concurrency in code. So we want to really favor immutability as much as we can. But the question is, how do we really create immutable code in Java? Well, sure, we can declare things final. Maybe we can prevent modifying things. But that kind of makes us wonder. Because we often modify state in objects. And is it even practical to think about creating code where we would actually keep things immutable? Well, actually, I have a good news for you. It is very practical to create a code where nothing is mutated. And I'm going to show you one such example right now. And I promise you, when you run this code, no state is ever modified. And here you go. That is the example of a code where nothing changes. And of course, there's a slight problem here. This code doesn't do anything useful either. So the minute we start doing anything with it, we have to start mutating state, isn't it? So that begs the question, is it even practical to do it? Well, I want to draw analogy to do something else a little bit. But before that, one of the key things about functional programming is functional programming emphasizes two different things. One is that we should program with immutability. They talk about pure functions. I'll revisit that a little bit later. They talk about immutability quite a bit. And they, they, it's near and dear to functional programming that we should honor immutability. And then, of course, we also use higher order functions as well. So one of the things about functional programming is it, it really says we should favor assignment-less programming. If you look at languages like uh, Erlang, for example, or even Haskell, 
Well, there is no assignment operator in those languages. So when you, in Erlang especially, if you say x equal to y, it's not an assignment equality, but it's actually a comparison. So if it really verifies that the value of x is equal to value of y, and if one of them is unbounded, it binds it the first time, but another time, if it's invalid, it tells you that it's actually you know, not really equal. So the question really is, is it practical for us to even create a program where uh, we can do assignmentless programming. Well, so from the practicality point of view, I want to really switch gears to something else from the past. So let's think about this a little differently. Think about structured programming for a minute. So what is what is structured programming espouse? It says that we have building blocks in code. We have an entry and an exit into these structures, and we build applications using these common structures. Like for example, an if statement or an if block or a while block or, or a do block and so on and function procedures. These are the building blocks of structured programming. But remember the good old times from uh, structured programming, and, and, and I can't think, uh, say, uh, you know, we probably cannot think about structured programming without thinking about the good old Edgar Dijkstra. What did Dijkstra tell us? He wrote a phenomenal paper where he said, go to is evil. And, and anytime anyone even thinks of writing go to, he, is, he moves in his grave. And, and that is basically the idea is we don't want to be writing code with go to's. Well, let's think about this for a second. If I say over here in this particular piece of code, if I were to simply call blah over here, watch this very carefully what error we are getting. It says blah, error, not a statement. Just leave the thought aside for a minute. Blah is not a statement. On the other hand, if I say go to, now look at the error we are getting. Java doesn't say not a statement. Instead, it says illegal startup expression. That kind of makes you wonder. What does that really mean? Well, what that means is go to actually is a keyword in Java, but they tell you, I dare you to use it. So they want to really prevent us from using this. So they made it a keyword and then made it forbidden. So we don't even you know, use it as a variable name or a function name ever. That's how much they actually went with the vengeance to say we shouldn't use it. So clearly, you wouldn't you know, really appreciate of anybody who uses a go to. If, if somebody tells you that they use go to in the code, you're going to distance yourselves from them. You wouldn't call them friend anymore. On Facebook, you'll unfriend them, right? That's how we feel about it. But the point really is, I'm going to write a for loop right here and say int i equal to 0, i less than 10, and then of course i plus plus. And in this case, let's do something really simple. If i is greater than 5, then I want to output the value of i. So nothing really exciting in this code, just a structured programming. Well, clearly we can all agree that this is a structured program. It's a really a nice if structure in there, a for structure in there, and the main procedure, hey, that's just life as usual in structured programming, no big deal. Well, not so fast. Let's come back to this for a second and take a look at it. Let's go ahead and say, Java P minus C, and I've already aliased minus C on my machine. So Java P, and let's take a look at the sample.class, if you will, just to take a look at the bytecode that we have here. And if you look at the bytecode, there is a beautiful surprise waiting for us in the bytecode level, and notice what we see right there. And you're like, oh my dear God, what just happened here? Well, the point really is, go to is like matches. I can bet you every one of you have matches in your house, isn't it? But you don't go to the children and say, children, I'm going to go take a shower. Here are some matches for you to play with. I hope you don't do that. Well, that's the exact point. Go to is for adults to deal with it, not for us to deal with it on a daily basis. Well, the problem really is, if we are using go to, the code turns into a spaghetti code. It becomes really hard for us to work with. So the, the essence really in this case is that we you know, say we shouldn't use go to, but I'm going to say go to is to structured programming as assignment is to functional programming. And the reason I want to draw this analogy here is, uh, or, uh, or parallel here is, that we do agree that we don't want to use go to, but just like what we saw, doesn't mean there is no go to. It is just that you and I don't use, use go to in our code, but there could be go to in layers below that we are calling. In a similar way, when we are writing code with assignmentless programming, it doesn't mean there is no assignment at all. It simply means that we don't do assignment in our code, but there could be assignment and mutation in layers below our code. 
But of course the question is, if we are mutating, what is the problem with that? Well, if you're mutating in your code, uh, describing what the code is doing, reasoning the code becomes really hard. Uh, understanding the code becomes hard. Uh, maintaining the code becomes hard. Making the code concurrent becomes really hard. And, and there are a lot of these problems we run into. I remember one day a developer came to me and said, I've written this code, it doesn't work, can you help me? And to be fair, it was not a very large piece of code. It was a function with only 30 lines of code. I quickly eyeballed it and I said, if you send this input, it should give you this output. He said, I know right, but it doesn't. So then we both are looking at it like stupid and going through every single line. And then I ask him the question, hey, on line nine, you're modifying the input variable given to you. Did you really mean to do it? He stood up for a second, stared at the code, and he said, I'm stupid, and he walks away. This is what happens when we start mutating code. It becomes really hard to reason, leads to errors and bugs in code. So the question is, you know, we don't want to do mutability in our code. But is it OK for mutability to happen in layers below? Well, here's the beauty. If you call a function a library, and if they do mutability, then what happens? Reasoning the code is not your problem. It becomes their problem. Understanding the code is not your problem. It is their problem. And maintaining the code is not your problem. It is their problem. And making the code concurrency is not your problem. It is their problem. And I love that, because in life, you want to make things always other people's problem. So this really works really well, because they can deal with it, and you don't have to deal with it in your level. So I'm going to say that go to is to assign structured programming, like assignment is to functional programming, meaning that we don't do, uh, the word I really want to emphasize here is explicit mutability. Uh, it should be avoided. So I'm not saying here. Uh, that we don't want to do mutability. What we are saying is we shouldn't be doing explicit mutability in our code. It could happen in a controlled fashion in layers below, and that's perfectly fine if that's what it's going to do. So having said that, let's talk about how we could potentially remove mutability. One is to really use recursion. So we could receive a parameter into our function, and rather than modifying the variable, we could return a value, a changed value of that function in memory as part of the stack call into another function. Uh, you know, really simple, for instance, something along the lines of if you want to call a function called increment and you are getting a value, let's say 5, well, what increment could do is take a value, but it could return again and say call increment value plus 1. And of course, in this case, we're not mutating the value. We are just calling the function by incrementing the value on the stack. So similar to this approach, we could use recursion to uh, prevent mutability in our code or avoid mutability in our code fairly well. So that is one approach we could take. The other approach, of course, is to, rem to move the mutability to layers below. In fact, in languages like Java, this is, while this could be a solution to begin with, it is not going to scale too well, unfortunately, because Java itself doesn't have tail call optimization today. And as a result, if it is a very large recursion, we're going to get a stack overflow e error, and that's not going to be really fun. So this is really useful for a very small uh, limit on the values, but not too extensively. But moving it to a lower level is probably a good idea. So what are some of the benefits of doing it? Well, this is where it moves towards a declarative style of programming. Let's look at a couple of different examples of this just to get a feel for it. Let's say I want to take a, a, a minute to uh, total values that are in a collection. How do I total values that are in a collection? Let's say I have a list of numbers 1 to 10 right here. And what I want to do is to total all the even numbers in this collection. Well, to total all the even numbers in the collection, first I'm going to say int total equal to 0. And I'm going to print the value of total when we are done. But what do we do? We say for int i equal to 0, i less than, or less than, uh, in this case, of course, numbers dot uh, size. And then I will say i plus plus. And then, of course, I will say if the value of numbers dot get of i is even, for example, in this case, is uh, you know, mod 2 is equal to 0, then I want to say total plus equal to, maybe I want to just total the double of all the values. So in this case, I'll say numbers dot get, and then times 2 all the double of even numbers in the collection. Well, that gives us a result of 60. 
But if you notice, there is a lot of mutation we do in this code. First of all, notice this poor variable i is not a constant. We keep incrementing the variable through the loop every single time. And so as a result, if you were calling another function which is an anonymous inner class scope, we cannot pass i to it, as you know, because i is mutable. So we do silly things in code, something like uh, int temp is equal to i, and then we would use temp inside that function uh, in inner class scope, because temp will become a local variable. And we have really written code like this in Java in the past quite a bit because of mutability intervening with what we do. And the second thing in this case is the variable total. If I turn up the volume of the computer and run the code, you will literally hear the variable total say, ouch, ouch, ouch on this code, because we are constantly changing that as well by mutating it. Well, the code worked, but like I said, that's a lot of effort to write this code. We have to reason with this code, turning the code concurrent. If I ask somebody, how do you make this code concurrent, usual response I get is laughter. Like, are you crazy? Are you kidding with me? Because it takes a lot of effort when you have mutability in code. How could we do this differently after all? Well, the one way to do this is to start with uh, uh, you know, the uh, collections and use an internal iterator. So we could say numbers.stream, then we do a filter, and we say given an element, element mark two is equal to zero, and then I can perform a map over here, and then I can say given an element, element times two, and then finally I perform a sum operation on this piece of code to get the result. So when I run this code, you can see that code produced the same result as the other one, but there are some really interesting differences in this code. If you look at this code, notice that the imperative style code was constantly mutating variables. The declarative and functional style code does not have any explicit mutability. And, and that is one of the beautiful things about this code. I'm very proud to tell you this code is very humane. No variable was tortured in the making of the result for this code. So that's basically one of the reasons why this is incredibly simple to make parallel as well if we choose to, and that gives us the benefit of avoiding explicit mutability. Now clearly in this case you may argue mutability is being done under the hood, and that is exactly the point I made earlier is it's okay for the mutability to be handled, uh, done under the hood, as long as that under the hood is a very trusted source, where they take responsibility to say, we will do mutation, but we will keep the mutation localized, and we will make it safe for concurrency without messing with performance and, and correctness, and that's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm okay for a trusted source in the layer below to handle the mutability. Similarly, this actually becomes a lot more effective moving forward. And I have to tell you, I have seen this code being written poorly so many times, so I want to emphasize it. It is to the point of being scary. I get email almost every single week from somebody saying, this code worked fine, and when I turned on parallel, it's all messed up. What am I doing wrong? So it's a very common anti-pattern people run into. Let's quickly take a look at this. So I want to double the values and put them into a collection. How do I do this? So I'm going to say numbers.stream, and I'm going to say dot filter, given a number, number mod two is equal to zero, and then I do a map over here, and I'm doubling the value. Everything went so beautifully well so far, and then, uh, uh, unfortunately, the programmer writing that code takes a U-turn for the worse. What the programmer then does is says, all right, this is good so far, list integer, well, let's say result is equal to, let's say in this case, new array list, and then comes along over here to say, I'm going to take this result and say for each, and given an element, I want to say result.add and put the element in this. And I'm going to just put, oh no, right here. Because people take uh, pictures and tweet these days. This is dangerous. If I just leave it without the comment, somebody says, this guy is stupid, he's writing this. So I just want to make sure don't ever do this, right? So the point really is, this is a terrible programming practice. Why? Well, the reason is, this code, you may even run this code and argue it works, but I think the words 
It works is a terrible choice of words in English to use when it comes to programming. I quit saying these days, the program works. Now I say, the program behaves. That's all I can say, because I cannot just predict what the correct result is. But the point really is, this code kind of behaves in one way, but the minute I turn the code into parallel, we can never predict what the result is going to be. There could be race condition in the code, it turns into a disaster. So what do we do to prevent this particular problem in this code? Like I said, if I you know, go back and print the result, you may even say that the result is there so it behaves, but it's necessarily not correct in this case. So this is where we would want to change this to using a collect method, for instance, and collect uses collectors, and in the collectors, of course, we would then say to list, for example, where we'll bring in the collectors, if you will, and as you can see, in this case, we can run this right here, and this is going to put this into a result of collectors, and we will, instead of assigning it, simply return the result of that into that variable, and we can simply use that in the code, as you can see right here. So the point really is, what does the collect method really do? Well, the collect method internally creates a, a, a collection, but it takes care of mutating the a list as we did before, but it does that in a very safe manner. In a way that if you turn on parallel, it will do this with threat safety as well, so you and I don't have to fight that problem. The creators of the method have taken care of it for us, so this is not only easy and elegant to write, it is also very threat safe for us to work with. So yes, there is mutability in this code, but no, we don't have to worry about it because they took care of the concurrency concerns, the minute we want to turn concurrency on this, that becomes really easy. So that brings up the question, where does this take us in terms of mutability? And to emphasize this, I want to talk about a couple of different things that are very critical to think about. And that is, I want to talk about pure functions. So what in the world is a pure function? Well, a pure function returns the same result uh, uh, result f uh, uh, as many times as you call it. So it returns the same result uh, for the same input, and of course, in this case, uh, no matter uh, how many uh, times uh, you call it. So um, this is one of the uh, features that you get out of a pure function. Uh, a, a pure function returns the same result for the same input, no matter how many times you call it. So in other words, it has uh, no uh, side effects. So in, in effect, you want the pure functions to have no side effect. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, two rules of purity. And this becomes extremely important as we go forward, because a lot of times, when I talk about these two rules of purity, when I mention the first rule, usual response is, duh, of course, that's obvious. Everyone knows it, absolutely. But it's a second rule that a lot of people don't think about, and I think the second rule is as important, maybe even more important than the first rule, or maybe they are equally important, it's a fair way to say it. So what is the rule number one for purity? Well, the function, you would say, does not mutate uh, any state, or we can say, does not change uh, anything. And of course, uh, you may immediately say, duh, of course, that is obvious. So a pure function does not change anything. And we can definitely agree to it right away and say, yep, that makes sense. A pure function does not change anything. But the rule number two is the function does not depend on anything that may possibly change. This is a very stringent and very highly important rule of purity of function. So it's not, so here's a slogan I like to use to emphasize it. A pure function sees no evil and does no evil, where I consider the mutability to be evil. It's not enough that you don't do evil, you should even not see evil. So if somebody is doing something really bad, you shouldn't encourage that either, that's what this really says. So essentially, 
from the purity of functions, you don't want to mutate something, but you also don't want to depend on something that is being potentially mutated. Let's understand this with a little example while we talk about the benefits of pure functions. And pure functions have a lot of benefits. It is amazing once we start looking at pure functions, how many real good benefits we get out of it. Let's talk about some of the benefits we get out of these. The first benefit of immutability is it opens the door to reason with the code really well. So when you're dealing with immutability, when you're dealing with pure functions, it becomes easy for you to walk through the code and describe what it is doing. I'm sure you have done this before, right? You're looking at a piece of code, it's so complex, and it's mutating every corner you turn, and you try to go up and down with this function, and finally you've had it. You take a piece of paper, you put the variable names on it, you are marching through, you're writing the values, and you're holding all that in your head. And while you're doing it, somebody opens the door and says, would you like to go to lunch? And what do you do at that point? You just stare at them. And they're like, are you OK? And you're not answering. You're still staring. And then they say, you weird. What's going on? And you say, look what you just did. And they took all the mental state you built. And by asking, do you want to go to lunch, they just shattered it. And that state is all here, and now you have to put this back in your head before you can start moving forward, and you really hate the person who just walked in. Well, you know, non-programmers never understand this. They come and ask the question, and like, you look weird. It's like, no, this is absolutely torture, because we have to rebuild all the state in our head before we can move forward, and that is the complexity we have to deal with. So when you're starting to really build all that state in your head, it becomes really hard, whereas, a code that doesn't deal with mutability becomes easier to reason. It becomes easier to understand as well as we are reading through it, easier to explain. But one big benefit is it is easier to test. What a, what a beautiful thought here. Now, if you have a function you are calling, and if that function changes state constantly, every time you call it, it gives you a different result. And uh, how would you work with such a function? Well, you are saying, you know what? I have a function over here, f1. I need to call this function f2. But this function f2 is a complete mess, because every time I call it, it gives me a different result. What do you do in that case? Well, what you do in that case is you say, test will call f1, but I will call a test double uh, to f2. This is, for example, what you use as you know, stub, mock, etc. So in other words, when a function you depend on is impure, you have to use stubs and mocks or test doubles to test that code. It becomes enormously complex. On the other hand, you're writing a function f1. That depends on a pure function f2. I don't need to do any stinking mock objects, because every time I call that function, it faithfully returns exactly the same result. I don't need any mocks to work with it. And I can just directly call it and benefit from it. So in a world of pure functions, we actually use fewer of these things like test double. Testing generally becomes a lot easier to work with. And that's definitely a, a good position to be in from the testability point of view for us. So no uh, stub or mock needed in this particular case because of that mutability concerns we have. Well, the next thing is we have referential transparency. What in the world is referential transparency? So referential transparency is a beautiful word, but here's what it means. A, an expression or a function may be replaced uh, by uh, its value or with its value. So in a sense, um, you are trying to say, I can take an expression or a function and I can replace it uh, with its value. So why is that a good idea? Well, if you call a function and it does all the work it needs to do to return the result to you, if I can replace it with the value, I don't have to do that work at runtime. This becomes really easy for us. Let's take a look at an example of that just to see how that may work. So I'm going to say over here, let's define a, a variable a equal to 1 and a, a variable b equal to 2. And let's make these two are, uh, as uh, static variables just for a minute in here. I'm going to go ahead and say output, let's say 7 plus 8 just for a minute. Look at 7 plus 8. Now 7 plus 8, you know 7 is a constant, uh, 8 is a constant, 
plus is a really wonderful function. It doesn't sneak around and mutate any state. So we can say that 7 plus 8 is a pure function. There's no doubt about it. So we can say 7 plus 8 is a pure. Well, if I run this, of course, it gives us a 15. Not a big deal. On the other hand, I'm going to say a plus b. Now the question is, is this pure? Well, let's apply rule number one. Rule number one says a plus b is pure according to rule one if a plus b does not mutate or change anything. And plus says I am innocent. I don't do any changes. You send me data. I'll give you a result. I am done with it. From rule number one, if our definition of purity was fairly limited and naive, we would have used only rule number one, and we will go home thinking this is a pure function. But rule number two says the function does not depend on anything that may possibly change. Well, gosh, A plus B, both A and B are mutable, so this is not a pure function after all because of rule two, uh, uh, fails, right? So fails rule two, and as a result, this function is not pure. Well, you know it, but guess what? The compiler knows it as well. Notice the result is three. I'm going to take all the effort to prove to you the code is doing what you expect it to do. So I'm going to go ahead and run Java P one more time. Notice what we see in this code right here. And right here is the I add function. It loads the field A and B performs the add to get the result of add, uh, adding A and B, and then sends the result to print. And so clearly, that was doing the work. However, I'm going to now go back to this code and change this to a final int A and int B. Now the question is, is this pure? And I am going to apply rule number one. Rule number one says A plus B does not change anything. Well, clearly we can agree A plus B doesn't change anything. Hey, but what about, does it depend on anything that may potentially change? Well, we know that A and B are final. They're not going to change. And as a result, I would argue this is pure. The result is still three. But not only do we know it, the compiler knows this as well. And the Java compiler says, aha, I could use referential transparency at this time. So if you notice over here in the code, there is no longer uh, the I add function in the bytecode. The compiler generously evaluated this function, replaced the function entirely with the result of that function. We just saw referential transparency in action. This is a very simple case, if you will, but what could a language potentially do if it knows that functions are pure, it can lead to better optimization at the compiler level. So in other words, it not just its referential transparency, but it leads to better optimization and performance as well, which is a great thing you can expect. This also leads to one other thing, which is memoization. This is something I learned when I was programming with Haskell. My mind was blown. I called a function which took literally 15 seconds to execute. And then the result came back and displayed. I was in the REPL. I don't remember quite why I did it, but I just said, run it again. And I was going to just relax, putting my hand in behind my head, taking a good break for about 15 seconds. But the second time I ran it, it snapped back with the response. I'm like, whoa, how did this really run so fast this time when it took 15 seconds the first time to run it? And that's when I discovered that Haskell, knowing that functions are really uh, pure, is performing memoization and optimization to a great degree under the hood automatically. So this can lead to that behavior as well. But one beautiful thing is immutability makes laziness possible. And this is a phenomenal behavior we can benefit from when it comes to performance of code. Let's understand this with quickly a little example here. Let's say for a minute in this case, I want to go ahead and write a list of numbers, 1 to 10 here. And, but in this list of numbers, I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 5, 4. Notice the sequence. But not what I want to do here is find the uh, a, a double of the first number greater than 3 and is even. So how do I do this in the imperative style of coding? Well, in the imperative style of coding, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a function for ourselves called, let's say, boolean is even. And this is going to take a number. 
and all it's going to do is return number, let's say mod two is equal to zero. Similarly, I'm gonna write two other functions. I'm gonna write is, um, uh, is greater than uh, three, and this is going to simply return number is greater than three, and then of course, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, uh, int double it, and I'm gonna simply return over here number is gr uh, times two. So I've got little functions that I'm gonna use right now. How do I do this in the imperative uh, style? In the imperative style, I'm gonna say result is equal to zero, and then I could say for int element in numbers, and then of course, I could say if element is greater than uh, three, and then of course, I could say for the element end is even for the element, then of course, I would say result is equal to, well, in this case, double it, and then of course, I would have to break out of the loop. And uh, uh, once I come out of the loop, I could simply print out the result I have on my hand and see what the result value is. In this case, it is eight. Well, we know one thing about this imperative code. While it took an effort to write it, it has got the performance we need. How much work are we doing in this function? We're doing eight units of work. It checks if one is greater than three, it is not. And because of short circuiting, it never checks for even. Then it checks for two and three. All of them are less than three. It checks five, which is greater than three. Checks if it's even, it's not. Then it checks if four is greater than three, four is even, and doubles it and break. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units of work. So the imperative code does eight units of work. That's awesome. We could be very happy about it. Let's write this function in functional styled instead. So what am I gonna do in here? I'm gonna then say over here, numbers.stream, and then I'm going to say dot for each, uh, for filter rather, and then in this case, of course, I'm gonna say, uh, given an element, I wanna ask if it is greater than three, and then I'm gonna say filter, I'm gonna ask if it is even, and then do a map over here, and in this case, I'm gonna ask it to double the value, and then finally, I'm gonna say find first, and get the first value, and if it doesn't exist, maybe I'll return a zero at this point. Now, when I run this code, you can see that it gave us the same value also. But that begs the question, how much more effort did we do? Make no mistake, if you look at languages like Python or Ruby or Groovy or JavaScript uh, as the language itself implements, these things are going to create one collection to a second collection to a third collection to a fourth collection and then throw away all those collections. The more garbage you create, the more garbage you have to collect. And if you have a very large collection, a million values, that will not be good in performance when you want a value which is short circuited. But thankfully, because of purity, we have a benefit. And the benefit is that purity leads to lazy evaluation. So what does that really mean? Well, in other words, what this means is, here's a way to think about it, about stream. Stream does not execute a, 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 a function on a collection of data. Instead, it executes a collection of function uh, on uh, each piece of data, uh, but uh, only as much as necessary. So this is a very different behavior of streams. So stream does not execute a function on the collection of data. Instead, it creates a collection of functions. It fuses these functions to the, together. Those three functions become one function under the hood, and that one function, it executes on every piece of data, but only as necessary. To understand this is really true, let's see if we can uh, you know, verify this. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out for just a second right here. And what I'm gonna do here in this code is to say output right here, and then we will say in here, uh, you know, is even uh, called, let's say, and this is gonna be a for, and we will output the number. Similarly, I'm gonna output over here is greater than called, let's go ahead and say that, and then finally I'm gonna say double it called for it. 
I'm running only the imperative style code right here, and notice the result of the imperative style code is exactly what you just saw here, is it calls those eight functions right there. And there's, uh, there's the is greater than called four times, is even called after that, and then is greater than called again, that's the output we saw. Now let's go back to this functional style code and see how this is going to work. Now, how, what does the functional style code do? It is absolutely lazy in its performance. And when I run this code notice, it also evaluated exactly the same number of times as the imperative style code did. And that is one of the beautiful things is, you don't have to really worry about doing all this extra work for it, yet it does the laziness for you automatically. Well, as a result, you get performance out of this code, and that is a huge benefit. So, you don't have to really worry about saying, oh gosh, I got beautiful elegance in this code, but what about performance? You get elegance and performance at the same time thanks to laziness. But how does it really relate to immutability? Let's talk about that real quick. Well, the beauty of this approach though is, is very short-lived if we don't honor immutability. So to understand this, let's step back and look at one other example which can illustrate this problem. Let's say for a minute we have, again, a collection of numbers, and in this case, I'm gonna just take a shorter collection, one, two, three. And what I wanna do here is create a stream, we'll say of integer right here, and these integer values, I'm gonna say stream is equal to, let's go ahead and say numbers.stream.map given an element, element times two. And then I'm gonna say stream.foreach, and we will say system.out over here, and uh, let's say uh, print line. So in this case, of course, we're just going to print those values out, and let's look at the lambda expression right now. You would argue this lambda is pure, isn't it? How is it pure? It doesn't change anything, and it is not affected by anything that may possibly change. How so? Two is a constant, E is the big integer, which is immutable, we are pretty safe right now. However, I'm gonna take this code and change it like this. Final int factor is equal to zero. Now in this uh, is equal to two. In this case, I'm gonna change this to factor. When I run the code, you can see the result still. The question is, is this pure or not? Well, I just put the word final here, even though that's not needed in Java 8, because in Java 8, we call them effectively final. And effectively final means it's as good as we treated it as final. So here's what effectively final means. Java says, you and I have been going out for 20 years together, I'll trust you. So if you don't put the word final, that's fine, as long as you treat it like it's final and don't mess around. So in this case, as you can see, we don't have to put final and the code still works, and this is still a pure function. However, if you notice over here, if I come in here and say factor equal to two. Now for a minute, I put the word final here and compile the code, error is in line 13. Line 13 says, no, you don't wanna do this because that variable is final. If you don't put final right here, and for just a minute, let me remove this code, and, and you can see that in this case, I don't have that code right now, and I mutate this, because it's not final, I don't get any errors. On the other hand, if I were to write a code like this, suddenly you know this is no longer pure. Why is it not pure? Because E times factor depends on a variable that possibly changes, in fact it does. In fact, notice, if I put the word final, the error is on line 13. If I don't put the word final, the error is on line number 11 because Java is trying to protect you and say, you don't wanna really do this in this case because that's not a pure function. Unfortunately, Java is not gonna protect you forever with cases like this. This is one of the differences between languages like Java and languages like Haskell. Java will tell you, don't do that. And then it will kind of walk away. It wouldn't nag you over and over. Language like Haskell is very different. It will tell you don't do it, but then it'll follow you home. It'll watch you while you're having dinner and say, don't even think about it. So this is where the difference is. In fact, this is one of the things I love about language like Java. Language like Haskell, 
enforce immutability. And the life is very boring. Can you imagine being a Haskell programmer? You go to work, you write code, everything works at 10 a.m. You take a long lunch, come back, do some more coding, and you go home tired. They say, how was the day at work? Nah, I did coding, everything worked, I'll go back tomorrow. In the case of Java, Java is different because Java doesn't enforce immutability, it just assumes it, which is beautiful. Because when a language makes assumptions, and when you violate those assumptions, you know who is going to get hurt. And, and if you code in Java, you'll be late at night debugging this. And then you go home very tired at 10.30, and the children say, wow, you're home finally. How was the day? Let me tell you the stories. We have stuff to talk about now, isn't it? So that's the whole point. This is really a disaster in the making. Why is that so? Well, as you can see here, Java said, don't do this. And yes, of course, we couldn't do it. Good news. Unfortunately, not all programmers are created equal. You know some programmers at work, when you show them that Java does this, they will have this very vicious villain smile on their face. And they will tell you, let me tell you how to fool Java. Very dangerous programmers. And they will come with a very weird sm smile and say, square bracket and say, uh, that I would say new int square bracket, and then do just that one over here. And I'm going to say, in this case, uh, a value of 2. Now I come in here and put a square bracket 0. And then, of course, let's just leave it as square bracket 0 for a minute. What's going to happen when we do this code? Hey, it seems like it worked, isn't it? But unfortunately, this is a disastrous programming. Why? Because if I change this code to a 0 and ask what the result is, the result is going to be one of three things. Somebody would say it's going to be 2, 4, and 6. Somebody else says it is 0, 0, 0. And somebody else says, let me think. In fact, the first two people also usually say, let me think. This is not a good programming practice. In fact, I use this as an interview question. I show this to people during interview and say, what is the result of this code? If they try to answer, I tell them you're fired even before you're hired. Because the right answer is, are you all stupid to write code like this? You are hired. Because I want people to write code that is easy to understand so we can actually release production code. I don't want a puzzler. But unfortunately, in this code, when you run this, notice it gave a 0. Make no mistake, you don't think that Java didn't care. In this case, Java actually cares. Java said, I told you don't do it, but you're not listening. But if you really closely look at the J Java C, you will see Java C actually shaking its head, thinking, who are your parents? How did they raise you to be like this? So absolutely, this is not what you want to do in writing code. This is really a bad programming practice, because this is impure code. Well, it turns out that impurity can cause quite a bit of trouble because laziness doesn't go with impurity, and the result becomes unpredictable. So don't do this. This is a bad idea. This also translates to what if you have a field within your class, and then your uh, uh, lambda is depending on the field, you could be in a similar situation as well. You have to be very careful about it. Well, so in other words, Im immutability is absolutely critical when it comes to laziness, and trying to use laziness without immutability is a disaster in the making. But, not, but then, of course, you cannot turn off laziness in those code. That's a default behavior in languages like Java and other languages, too. So we have to abide by the rule of the land. And finally, I'll quickly mention that uh, uh, laziness, immutability rather, makes parallelization very affordable as well. Because you're not dealing with shared immutability, you have the safety net of the, um, you know, not having affected by the shared mutable variables, and you don't have to worry about race conditions in your code. That becomes a lot better for you to work with. So the, does it really mean that we have to really deal with total immutability? And practically, we can approach this with the design by telling ourselves, you know, maybe we could use data structures that can promote immutability. Maybe we can you know, push immutability to layers below so we don't have to deal with it. And take a look at data structures that provide uh, you know, uh, immutable uh, access to those and evolve in a reasonable amount of time, complexity and space complexity. We can program with those. 
Languages like Java, we can also use libraries that are uh, providing that as well. So in a sense, one of the key things to think about is purity of functions, and we have to honor purity in a lot of cases, and if we don't, uh, a lot of other constructs rely on that kind of purity, and then without uh, really honoring purity, our programs may end up really producing uh, rather unpredictable results, and that's not going to be fun spending the time debugging that code. So immutability, immutability is very critical in the modern days that we live in, and, and those are some of the ways we could probably focus on achieving it, but we have to be very cautious when it comes to languages like Java as well. Hope that was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benkat. Uh, does anybody have any questions? And also, once you exit this, the room, please don't forget to vote. Anybody has questions for Benkat? Please. Is there um, a way like a lint where Java could say, careful, that was a pure functional, and now you've uh, introduced something? I mean, cause you, showed, you showed it because you knew, but is there some uh, help which we could have? Right, really good question. Uh, the short answer is not yet. So I think as time goes on, we will have uh, better tools that can do it, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, you know, in the past, tools like FindBugs have helped us a lot to find some of those things, uh, and that's kind of where we need to really rely upon. Uh, it would be ideal if the compiler itself can really prompt us, uh, but you know, without that, uh, Lint tools would be really useful. Uh, I, I'm, I don't think we are too far from it, uh, but it's not there yet. Thank you for your talk. Just a uh, quick question. So Java is really popular because of uh, GDBC and stuff. So all database calls are, immu are not pure, right? So we'll, how would we do deal with that? Really good question. Um, so um, what, I, what I normally talk about uh, is I talk about the designing functional systems. And, and I, I'll just throw a little cat's phrase for that. I, I normally say uh, a circle uh, of uh, purity uh, and then uh, with a small, let's say, a thin uh, uh, ring of impurity. Uh, so what I mean by that is you want to create a circle of purity, and within that circle of purity, you don't do any immutability. So this, this is architecturally, there's a bit of a reverse of how we normally do this. We put the database right here, and we build functions around it. Uh, instead, let's, let's reverse it. Let's put functions in the middle, and let's put UI and database on the circle, the ring. So we will do the immutability, enter the circle of purity, or the functional pipeline, keep that pure. When you finish it, get out of the functional pipeline and then do the impurity. So the database operations, UI, all that I do on the thin ring of the peripheral, rather than saying, I'm going to do it right in the middle of the pipeline. So think about the pipeline as a train for a second. When you look at a pipeline, when, when, you are, when you're looking at the code, which is a pipeline, of course, the very short pipeline, but all these dots, if you will. So if you were to go through this pipeline of code, if you think about it as a train, you want to get into a train before the train leaves. You want to get out of the train when the train reaches the destination. You never want to get out of the train or get into it while the train is in motion. Not a good idea. It's the same way I think about it. So think of it as a train. Do the impurity before you get in. Do the impurity after you get out, but never when you're in the transit. So I, I design it with uh, things around it. Just as a quick side note, I'll mention one small thing. Uh, one thing that really excited me and changed my way of thinking is the language called Elm. Elm is a Haskell syntax with a little bit of F sharp that compiles down to JavaScript. Knowing it's JavaScript that's running, I constantly start thinking about it. And I said, wow, Elm actually does that exactly. They do the UI on the peripheral, and then they push through functions, take the result, and they do the mutation on the outside. So looking at languages like Elm can give us a good inspiration how we can actually do that circle of purity and a thin ring of impurity. That could be a really good design approach. Good, very good question. Thank you. No more questions? Well, thank you very much again, Becca. Thank you. This has been very enlightening. Thank you. And again, please remind, let me remind you, uh, don't forget to vote. <laughs>